once again for all those that have just recently joined. Uh, I'd like to thank you to, uh, for joining us for tonight for the introduction to SIBO part one, the what, why, and how to test uh, with myself, uh, Dr. Bradley Bush uh, from Norovana. So my, uh, just a little bit about myself. Uh, I am a naturopathic doctor. Uh, I've graduated uh, out of Portland, Oregon. I am the owner and clinical director at uh, the Natural Medicine of Stillwater uh, Clinic in the beautiful city of Stillwater, Minnesota. Uh, I am the owner operator of the Neurovana Laboratory, uh, which is a special specialty lab testing, uh, specialty lab testing the, uh, for small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. And uh, what I'd like to mention is that uh, we are uh, currently in an expansion mode and offer, we'll be offering some additional breath testing uh, at the end at the beginning of the year. Uh, I myself am a proud uh, I myself am a proud uh, father of four children and I have a naturopathic wife who is also an owner operator of the Neurobiota Labs. So what are we going to talk about today? Uh, we're going to talk about uh, the defining, uh, we're going to define and explain SIBO and how you can explain that to, see, to patients. Uh, uh, in addition to that, uh, you will have a better understanding of the gastrointestinal and extra gastrointestinal symptoms caused by SIBO. Um, let's see. Uh, you, you can, uh, you'll be learn to, comp uh, to confidently screen patients for uh, breath testing have familiarity with breath testing uh, with, uh, uh, without worrying about interfering factors. Uh, I apologize, I'm adjusting my, my microphone for you guys. Be able to explain breath testing preparation uh, diets to your patients and understand the best techniques for accurate breath sample collection and be familiar with commonly asked questions regarding uh, breath testing. So, what are we looking at when it comes to small intestinal uh, uh, bacterial overgrowth? We're looking at patients who are always saying that they're, they're bloated and too gassy, that you know, their problems all started after a round of antibiotics, and that uh, their illnesses had created food allergies. Uh, my joints and muscles uh, uh, ache after eating uh, certain foods, and my joint uh, my headaches uh, are worse after eating certain foods, that these people often have success on the paleo diet or the Whole30 diet, uh, Atkins diet. Uh, they've been very successful on GAPS or low FODMAP diets. Uh, but even though that they're better on these restricted diets, uh, they can't expand their diet menu and they're kind of stuck in this highly restricted uh, food uh, uh, cycle. So what is SIBO? And of course, I put some pictures of some classic SIBO things, which are like, it appears like a fermenting uh, belly. So uh, small intestinal bacteria of overgrowth uh, is defined as an excessive amount of bacteria in the small intestines. And that uh, SIBO is where colonic or large intestinal bacteria, those that are typically anaerobic bacteria, that are found now in large quantities in the small intestines. So, an area where they should be only found in very trace amounts, uh, where they ferment disaccharides uh, and fibers, uh, which then lead to that excessive fermentation. Uh, most common, uh, uh, commonly, the bacteria then produce gases, uh, hydrogen and, and methane gases, in addition to hydrogen sulfide gases, as byproducts of that uh, uh, metabolism of sugars. Now, one thing to remember, your body doesn't make any gases. The only time you have gas is when bacteria are feeding on the sugars. So uh, once again, if the person has a lot of gas and bloating, it's coming from bacteria. More times than not, it's probably because of the SIBO overgrowth. Uh, common strains uh, of SIBO include uh, your streptococcus, your E. coli, your staphylococcal, your Klebsiella, but even your, your Clostridium. Bactericides and even lactobacillus, obviously not uh, the acidophilus, but other lactobacilli can also be uh, fermenting SIBO bacteria. Now, bacteria is mostly, most of the bacteria in our gut is limited to the large intestines. 
though, your large intestines have 17 times more bacteria than your small intestines. It is normal to have that large intestines be a large fermenta fermentation vesicle. It is designed for that. That's why the tight junctions in the large intestines are so strong. Your large intestines uh, has all that fermentable activity going on, that metabolic activity for the, for the bacteria, but it's not releasing the toxins into circulation. The large intestines will absorb water, uh, salt, and small chain fatty acids. But when you bring those bacteria and start letting them ferment in the small intestines, that's when you have a lot uh, uh, more, more problems. You have a large quantity of metabolic waste produced by the bacteria that are now being absorbed because guess what? The small intestines, that's its job, is to absorb. Uh, nutrients and things. So their tight junctions are much less uh, tight. So uh, now most of your bacteria uh, in food are killed by your acid in your stomach and sometimes guess what? A lot of people don't have as much acid not only to knock out that bacteria but then to help start the process of digestion which can in itself lead to a small intestinal bacterial growth with or without other causation. Uh, and uh, one of the things to remember is that hey you know uh, avoiding or living on these restricted diets like a low FODMAP diet or a GAPS diet for a very long time, even though it may uh, be better than the alternative, i.e. maybe some joint pains or fibromyalgia uh, or, or, or even worse, but uh, the restriction of entire food groups like grains could all, will also eventually lead to a dysbiosis in the large intestines. And the large intestines was designed to have more bacteria to ferment these uh, foods and, of course, produce the, the short chain fatty acids, which are very useful for the uh, muscles and the brain for energy. So SIBO, common SIBO symptoms. The classic symptoms are your nausea, your flatulence, your bloating, your diarrhea, bad breath, halitosis, constipation, and of course, in more severe cases, malnutrition. Other symptoms that are not always classically pinpointed as classic SIBO symptoms, but we see all the time with our patients, are the muscle weakness, the joint pains, the brain fog, the anxiety, insomnia, headaches, heartburn, GERD, neuropathies, and skin rashes. And I threw in for um, our chiropractic uh, friends uh, and our naturopaths that do manipulation, uh, the ileocecal valve dysfunction. Uh, a lot of times you'll, 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 uh, people will feel that and palpate it and, and identify it. Uh, chronic hiatal hernias. Uh, and of course, for those patients whose uh, adjustments never stick, they're constantly going out, a lot of times that SIBO is that uh, root cause to chronic inflammation that keeps people from actually getting their optimal health. So in the research, uh, one, of the st one study did a meta-analysis that looked at uh, all the different published studies of SIBO and look at their prevalence rates with other conditions. Uh, in a healthy, normal control population where you, the person's not complaining about anything, the prevalence of SIBO is between 0 and 20 percent, okay? So that's not a huge amount of people. So it's not as if there is a uh, issue with everything, with every person. Uh, now, put that, though, with people with celiac disease. Up to 67 percent of the, of the patients with celiac will have SIBO. Uh, with your IBDs, your Crohn's and ulcerative colitis, 88, 81 percent. Get this. Fiber Chronic fatigue syndrome, 81% of the time, and fibromyalgia, 93% of the time. Uh, and we'll talk a little bit about that uh, a little bit later. Irritable bowel syndrome, up to 78%. It's been reported uh, by a lot of gastros that between 50 to 80% of all constipation and diarrhea are due to SIBO. Uh, and of course, it's not ever fully addressed. Uh, most of the times, uh, patients are just told to just live with it. Uh, and deal with it, which is just a terrible uh, uh, prognosis. Uh, gastrectomies, connective tissue disorders like scleroderma, uh, type 2 diabetes, up to 44% of people with type 2, 54% of the people with hypothyroidism, and I'll talk a little bit about uh, hypothyroid in, in a little bit, but one, of course, number one, one of the number one, uh, or should I say, no, one of the main side effects of hypothyroidism is constipation and slow gut motility which of course leads to that higher 
uh, growth of bacteria in the small intestines. Obesity, up to 41%. Rosacea, there's actually a great study uh, published about rosacea uh, it directly being linked to SIBO. And about half the patients with rosacea, if you treat their SIBO, the rosacea will go away. I mean, it's just the, it's it's 50%. So it's like, well, yeah, that should be part and parcel of any rosacea workup. And of course, hypochlorhydria. So I wrote a blog and I kind of put together this table uh, because I'm in I'm in this beautiful state of Minnesota. And Minnesota is absolutely gorgeous and we love our outdoors. But guess what? The outdoors is fighting back in a little bit. Not only do we have mosquitoes the size of small hawks, but we have uh, an entire region infested with ticks. And we're one of the big uh, epicenters of Lyme disease in this country. And it's been going on for a very long time and what fell under the radar for a very long time. Uh, but what we see in my clinic is that many people do get Lyme, they did get treated, but then they still have lingering problems. They Sometimes they get Lyme and they don't get it all the first time around. They have to go on antibiotics again, maybe sometimes for years uh, on end. But ultimately, if in a lot of times when you're looking at people with persistent or chronic Lyme, they're, they're uh, gauging people's illness and success of treatments by monitoring symptoms. Well, once again, if you're only monitoring symptoms, the one great thing about symptoms is that they usually lie a lot. Uh, it's not that the patient doesn't feel them, it's just that many other conditions can lead to those symptoms. And when you, when you line up all the different side effects that Lyme disease, the co-infections co that BC and Bartonella all can cause, those directly can line up with, with, how, with the activity of SIBO and of course, antibiotic, the side effect of antibiotics. So uh, what I work with a lot of our patients, uh, because we, do, we treat a lot with Lyme and, and help uh, co-treat with a lot of patients with Lyme, is that first and foremost, uh, if you have uh, a Lyme disease or you've been diagnosed with chronic uh, Lyme disease, the first and foremost is if you have any other indicators that indicate you might have a small intestinal bacterial overgrowth, we'll test that uh, because treating uh, SIBO is, is a much more laser focused and better prognosis than trying to look for uh, a, a chronic infection that may or may not even be there. Now, uh, secondly, uh, there's another study that showed the overlap between uh, small intestinal fungal overgrowth uh, along with SIBO. And, you know, and I always talk about this with my patients is that, you know, for the most of the time, you know, when people have a fungal overgrowth, most fungus in the GI tract is pretty easy to knock out. You can knock it back quite a bit uh, with some garlic, with some caprylic acid. I mean, you just go down the road, of, uh, the row of all your favorite treatments. You can use Ziflucan or other prescriptions if you care to. But it, many times the patients will say, well, it come, my, my uh, fungal overgrowth came back. Well, if the fungus overgrowth is coming back, uh, then you must have some other root cause problem. That root cause problem very well could be uh, the small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. Now, in the, in the, as you can see uh, from the slide, the incident rate of SIBO is actually much greater than the fungal overgrowth in itself. And what I usually tell patients is that, you know, we're going to treat your fungal overgrowth no matter what, uh, because the, um, uh, because the, uh, we're going to treat your fungal overgrowth no matter what, because at, uh, 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 because the herbs that we're going to start using first and foremost, uh, for your treatment are going to be antifungals in addition to antimicrobials. Now, there's a lot of underlying issues with SIBO. Uh, one of the, uh, they kind of get put into three different camps, anatomic anomalies, uh, uh, motility dysfunction, and then others. So, of course, with the anatomical abnormalities, you're going to have the gastric uh, atrophy, duodenal and jejunal uh, diverticula. Obviously, if you have pouches gathering food, uh, they're going to lead to a, a good area of, of, of fermentation and oftentimes swelling and lack of motility. Stenosis and obstructions are very common. 
uh, of post-surgical alterations, uh, which leads to oftentimes, you know, after surgery, you get a, a lot of scar tissue. Uh, they call them blind loop scarring. That actually leads to uh, areas where uh, food don't get passed through through the small intestines. Uh, you also have motility dysfunctions, and we see more and more of these uh, with modern uh, chronic disease. Uh, you would have systemic sclerosis, uh, Parkinson's disease. Uh, Parkinson's and gastroparesis and SIBO are extremely well linked. So if you have part of your Parkinson's disease patients workup is to monitor not only their motility, but also uh, any side effects of overgrowth. Uh, diabetic neuropathy, uh, you have, you once again, a big cause of gastroparesis uh, that, uh, that leads to a dysfunction in, in, in the movement of foods and also the sweeping and cleaning of the bacteria downstream. And of course, in ileocecal valve incontinence, and I actually had an interest in a whole family where genetically they, the ileocecal valves never properly worked. Uh, they, in a combination with autoimmune issues in their in their family, it was a double whammy, and they uh, the whole family just kept getting SIBO over and over. Uh, it's it's actually really uh, difficult to to work with it because you have a, a major gastroparesis layered on top of it in uh, ileocecal valve incontinence, and then of course other conditions. There's the, what we all like to hear: aging. Yeah, aging uh, is never fun. Uh, I think a lot of people fight it all the time. I, I, I'd like to say that I'm going to embrace it. Uh, I, I, I like to believe that we'll, we'll, I'll, I'll age, I'll get wiser, and eventually I'll walk off in the forest and, and meet a bear and, 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 and see the end. But uh, with aging, it also leads to slower, uh, uh, less hydrochloric acid production, decreased motility. Uh, malnutrition, uh, especially B12 and folate deficiencies, can lead to uh, um, SIBO. And of course, acid blocking medications, uh, your proton pump inhibitors, etc. They are a big cause of SIBO. I always call the 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 acid blockers uh, the gateway drugs. It's a gateway to many other problems in the future. So uh, th there's many nutri nutrient deficiencies that occur secondary because of the malabsorption uh, in uh, uh, with SIBO because when a ba the bacteria from your large intestines overpopulates the small intestines, the function of the small intestines uh, um, no longer is there, and so uh, by uh, for a lot of different reasons, there's different malabsorptions from common nutrients that need to have bacteria uh, to help it be converted, but also for fat soluble vitamins and whatnot. So vitamin A deficiencies are very common, vitamin D, vitamin E, K, all your fat solubles. Uh, your B12 deficiency is actually rather common and can actually be a cause of uh, the SIBO itself. Uh, you can get uh, hypoalbuminemia, which is going to lead to a lot of edema, and we see that quite a bit. So not only uh, does the SIBO lead to a lot of swelling, in the, in, especially in the lower, in the legs, uh, in the feet, uh, but then eventually in, into the hands and fingers. Uh, so the combination of treating adrenal gland insufficiency along with uh, SIBO is a great one-two punch when you see those patients walking in the door fat malabsorption, carbohydrate malabsorption, and iron deficiency. There is so much iron deficiency in this country still. No matter how rich and wonderful we are, how diverse our diets supposedly should be, uh, we still have a huge amount of uh, uh, a, a microcytic anemia, oftentimes masked because of our macrocytic anemias. Um, I also wanted to highlight um, uh, uh, that magnesium. So because SIBO often occurs with hypochlorhydria, many of our minerals are depleted in the body. We're just not absorbing them from our foods or even some of our supplements that we're taking. And because of that, you get some early indicators. And one of the very first indicators that people get outside of iron deficiency is magnesium deficiency, the muscles uh, twitching that freaks people out, thinking that they might have a massive infection, uh, in addition to uh, muscle cramps, uh, restless legs, etc. So when we're looking at testing, uh, I mean, when breath testing became a uh, available for practitioners to run on their patients out of their 
out of their uh, offices. It was a huge change in what I did in my clinic. And it, breath testing became really high on the hierarchy list when uh, a person had presenting symptoms that, that, uh, that indicated uh, that it would be part of the differential. So uh, one of the things that we, we know from literature is that uh, the experts in breath testing and gastroenterologists uh, definitely believe that before you do a fructose or lactose malabsorption test, uh, you should always rule out SIBO because if you have SIBO, you will get a false positive using fructose or lactose. So there's no sense testing for those malabsorption uh, syndromes when uh, you have an overgrowth that can lead to a false positive. So, and it's very well understood and agreed upon that that which should always be done. And guess what? In, in a lot of conventional settings, they're still running uh, the fructose and lactose first. Prioritize your testing. So in the world of all the different things you, that are commonly run to look at uh, uh, with patients, and of course with every patient you have to you have to uh, uh, triage their money and what they're spending their money on, and so I put breath testing as a first thing, especially if your if your patient is presenting with all those classic or non-classic symptoms. After that, after you do the breath test and you rule out SIBO, which is once again uh, occurring between 50 to 80 percent of the time in IBS, up to 80 percent of the time in your chronic fatigue fibromyalgias, you do that first because if you do have that get that bacterial dysfunction and you address it and treat it, many things downstream and through the body will change and that includes organic and when you when you're looking at things for organic acid testing food sensitivity testing and stool testing those tests often will have many more uh, 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 background noise on the test many positives many kind of strange readings because of the bacterial overgrowth in the small intestines so why even go down that road uh, with these general screening tests when you have a primary root cause uh, and for example you get you do it uh, if you do an organic acid test with a patient you're going to have all these different markers that are going to show fungus overgrowth dysbiosis of the bacteria some inflammatory markers could be elevated Elevated, some fat could be off, uh, could be malabsorption of fat could be shown, and you're looking at all these things, and you might you might be triaging them and and, and then kind of re reducing them down to different individual treatment protocols. But in all reality, the basis behind it all is one root, one common uh, 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 cause, the SIBO itself. So treat that first. If they still have issues, then run the test. Likewise, with food sensitivity testing. Whether it's IgG, IgA, if you use uh, MRT or ALK, whatever whatever methodology you use, when a person has a small intestinal bacterial overgrowth, they're going to have a a root cause of gastrointestinal uh, dysfunction, a uh, increased intestinal permeability, a more activated immune system. It's going to be a leaky gut syndrome. You're going to have a lot of false positives on that food sensitivity test if you just do that first and foremost. If there's presence of SIBO, so rule out the SIBO first, and then if you if you still have issues, uh, then you do a food sensitivity test. It gets rid of that background noise, so that then what does come out positive are more meaningful so you can uh, be a little bit more uh, focused on the on the test and likewise with stool tests they kind of falls in the same uh, uh, conversation so rule out SIBO with the with the breath test first focus on that root cause that helps save some uh, money and of course it will improve the accuracy of other tests by eliminating that root cause problem then you're you're going to be able to actually use those testing uh, to the patient's advantage even more now breath testing was originally uh, created to detect lactose intolerance and then was eventually ex uh, 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 other sugars were used because uh, the, you can see that people had uh, malabsorption syndromes to fructose and to mal uh, maltose and to sucrose. 
Uh, so why breath testing? Well, breath testing with patients is not invasive. It's low cost. It's simple, easy uh, to, to assess many common GI problems. Uh, it helps define what dysbiosis or leaky gut is. Because, you know, if a person has a root cause behind their dysbiosis or leaky gut, well, you know, for more, more times than not, SIBO is one of the main culprits. After SIBO, of course, there can be many other reasons behind it then you can you can rule out other things and work on them it just makes your other work that much easier uh support you have a, a breath testing uh can support many proven treatments against SIBO and it helps, helps you uh, reassess them to uh to make sure that your treatments were efficacious uh and of course you know we don't guess if someone has high cholesterol. We measure their their bad cholesterol to see what their LDLs are and the HDLs and see what their true cardiac risk is. If the person has diabetes or blood sugar issues, we measure the glucose, we measure the insulin levels, we measure their hemoglobin A1C. We don't guess what it is. We wanna know, well, is this a big issue or a little issue? Do we need really big guns? We need to just manage it a little bit differently. Uh, without testing, you don't know. SIBO is the same way. And so for some people, their SIBO might be a little, might be a minor irritation, might be a minor part of their problems. For other people, it may be the problem that they have. So one of the things that bre uh, breath testing is really good is it helps with understanding the degree intensity of the problem, uh, the location, and the type of overgrowth because this will change how you approach that patient. Uh, and here's an example of a patient with, more, one, of the, with one of the more classic hydrogen positive uh, SIBO results. Uh, you can see on the graph uh, is sort of a, 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 a series of measurements that we run for breath collections after a baseline, uh, a challenge with a, with a sugar substrate. Uh, in this particular case, it was lactulose, and then testing. Uh, we'll talk about we'll talk about interpretation of the test results in our second webinar in our series. But what I wanted to have you appreciate was the fact that this is an abnormal high level of activity, both in the small intestines and then later on in the large intestines. It, and even though there's no real criteria, when you see enough of these tests, you kind of identify it's like wow, there's a lot of activity going on. Uh, so not only was there, w is there a, a, a decent amount of activity in this case, you know, it's not world-class bad, it's a moderate bad, but it was also uh, uh, more active in the lower small intestines, not the upper small intestines, uh, and it was just hydrogen positive, not methane positive, versus here's another person who had wicked, crazy, very high activity, uh, in uh, in the earlier uh, and uh, uh, later uh, small intestines. Uh, so the whole entire GI is mostly off. He had one little area where it wasn't as bad. But uh, overall, this is a you know much more challenging patient. It was both hydrogen and methane positive, which means it's a more difficult bacteria to knock out. And because it, it, of the location, both upper and lower small intestines, you're going to get some symptoms in the upper small intestines uh, that a person in, with just lower uh, small intestinal overgrowth won't have. They might have more of the nausea, the belching, the abdominal pain under the rib cages, maybe heartburn or GERD. Uh, those are all things that not only can be pre presented right now, but when you start treating them, they may have that die off that then flares that up. And so it's nice to be aware of what that is. So the breath test screening. Uh, so first off, like when I see a patient, I want to make sure that uh, they have some uh, 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 pretty general uh, symptoms that are that are associated with it. So it's like, hey, uh, do you, are you bloating? Do you have gas? Do you have any abdominal pain, diarrhea, uh, or just general discomfort? Next, on my labs that I'm running, a lot of my, uh, my screening labs that I'm doing with my patients in general, I'm looking for iron deficiency, microcytic anemia. I'm looking for uh, low serum B12 or macrocytic anemia, big red blood cells. And I'm also looking at myeloperoxidase uh, levels. Myelopro myel myeloperoxidase is an enzyme produced by neutrophils. Uh, it's commonly included in cardiovascular labs because it's a, it can be used to monitor uh, uh, progressing 
atherosclerosis and arteriosclerosis and damage to blood vessels. Um, but in the number one interfering factor with it is, is gastrointestinal issues uh, because neutrophils will migrate towards epithelial cell damage. Uh, in itself, when you have myeloproxidase high, not only could that imply SIBO, doesn't, doesn't diagnose it, but it sure can imply it, but it also implies that they're having more damage to intestinal mucosal, which, which suggests that you need to put some more gut healing protocols along with whatever treatment you're doing. Physical exams. Physical exams are important. Uh, pa pa uh, doctors uh, and, and practitioners got to put their hands on the patient sometimes uh, to identify uh, a few things that are very common uh, in SIBO patients. Uh, the descendant abdomen, um, gas being collected within the abdominal cavity. Uh, muscle guarding, when you're actually doing a, uh, an abdominal exam, these people are going to be like squirming and, 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 and uh, 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 muscles will be spasming, guarding themselves because they don't want to get uh, injured. Uh, lower right quadrant pain, uh, and I'll show you a little slide on that in a second, but that's where your ileocecal valve is. Uh, latent tetany, because they might have a magnesium deficiency or a B12 deficiency. Uh, polyneuropathy. I mean, many people will have neuro, uh, neuropathies, and they're actually caused by the SIBO, uh, and also skin issues, including rosacea. So when you're palpating that lower right quadrant, uh, take it. Uh, definitely go in there and dig around in there. Once again, the ileocecal valve is a small, is a smooth muscle. That smooth muscle uh, should be subtle to touch. It should be. It shouldn't be tender. It shouldn't be hard. It should be just a nice regular muscle. And oftentimes you'll you'll definitely get that. And so if you're if the person's presenting symptoms are a little on the iffy side, but then you go in and you palpate, and their ileocecal valve is painful to the touch or hard uh, uh, or irritated and swollen. Uh, all right, well that gives you a really good indicator that it probably is a small intestinal back overgrowth. Uh, how about the hiatal hernia area? So SIBO activity, especially in that upper small intestines, can uh, result in altered gas pressures and tenderness upon palpation in that area. Um, we often see when we press down in that hiatal hernia area, uh, with patients, uh, you'll you'll hear some gas bubbles sometimes. You'll uh, they'll be really uh, sensitive and tender initially, but then as you hold it there, they'll relax a little bit more. And once again, that's a great indicator that there is some gas pressure differentials going on, usually caused by excessive gas creation in that upper small intestines where it shouldn't be, causing then problems with some of the uh, sphincters, uh, the upper and lower esophageal sphincters, uh, uh, affecting then digestion and causing heartburn. So what is the process of breath testing? Well, basically the, the process is, is that you do a one or two day prep diet. So it pretty much everyone's one day with the exception of constipation, it's two days. And so some people will say, well, hey, as long as I eat a certain way and I take a huge amount of laxatives or things that I use as a laxative, I don't have constipation. Well, ding, 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 that should be a, 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 a light bulb in your head that says, all right, well, uh, you're gonna be uh, removing these things for about uh, four days or so. You're probably gonna get constipated, so you should probably do a two-day prep diet. And that'll help in making sure that your uh, uh, baseline tests are as accurate as possible. So don't be fearful in telling someone that a two-day prep diet may be needed. It will help, help them in the long run by improving their quality of their test. Uh, very important is a 12-hour fast overnight that helps uh, make sure that things are nice and calm and, uh, within the GI tract. And then what you're going to do is the patient's basically uh, uh, doing this prep diet. They're fasting overnight, uh, and then they're going to wake up in the morning, and they do a baseline test. Uh, so they blow into this little apparatus uh, to collect a sample. Then... Uh, and, and that is uh, uh, symbolized by that little green dot. They're kind of doing that baseline test. Then they're drinking a solution, whether it be glucose or lacto lactulose, and then they set their uh, alarm to, for 20 minutes. And then every 20 minutes, they do another breath test. And the sugar, the sugar is going to start moving downstream. And it takes about two hours for it to move through the small intestines and another hour to move in the large intestines. And as it goes down every 20 minutes throughout uh, the whole series of testing, 
uh, they start collecting their samples and you start mapping out that small and large intestines for the gas levels that are being produced. So there's very few contraindications for doing breath testing. Uh, the biggest ones are really just known or suspected hypoglycemia, postprandial hypoglycemia, and then of course allergies to the sugar substrates. So typically if a person has uh, diabetes, if they have really severe hypoglycemia, uh, drinking a uh, 75 grams to 100 grams of glucose is probably not uh, the, w what they wanna do. Uh, that's where it's sometimes good to get have to make sure that you have a, a use lactulose for that situation. Lactulose, of course, is a prescription med, uh, so if that's the case, they may need to have someone script that for them. Uh, but that is really the only major contraindications for doing it. Now there is a little prep for this, so that you know you the goal is to measure their SIBO gas activity. So you don't want to have anything to disturb the gut flora or the motility of their GI tract uh, when they're testing. This will improve your testing uh, outcomes. So what you want to do, uh, antibiotics, antifungals, it's a four week washout from them. Now that's not uh, herbal antibiotics or herbal antifungals, but I often will lump them all together for simplicity's sake. But any prescriptive uh, antibiotics and antifungals, it's a four week washout before testing. Uh, you should also wait two weeks after any surgery, colonoscopy, enemas, or colonics. Now that raises a flag sometimes because I have a number of patients that are doing uh, a coffee enemas on a regular basis. And if they didn't have a coffee enema, they'd be plugged and they'd be in the ER. Uh, or they're doing coffee enemas uh, due to, for other conditions as part of a detox program that they've been doing. And you know, so once again, if they're doing these enemas all the time to sustain uh, 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 regular bowel movements, well, okay, we might want to remove them for a day or two, but we don't want them to get really plugged up and maybe obstructed. At the same token, if they're having all the symptoms of SIBO while they're still doing this, they're probably still going to be positive for SIBO if they continue with it. So we don't have to take everything by the uh, the rule of law, especially because many patients would never test then. And honestly, the test data is usually just hunky-dory fine with them anyway, so you might as well ga gather that data because that's one of the reasons why they have to use the enemas all the time because they probably have a really high uh, overgrowth of some SIBO. Now, four days before the test, you want to avoid all laxatives. That's not that's 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 your general over-the-counter laxatives. That's your Senna, but it could also include, you know, if you're using high doses of vitamin C, magnesium, or even probiotics to induce a laxative effect. You need to remove those for about four days. And sometimes you're negotiating with patients. It's like, okay, if I if I do it for four days, I won't have a bowel movement for four days, and then I'll be obstructed and they'll be horrible. All right, well, great. We'll do it for two days. Let's let's compromise because if you're that bad, well, your test is probably going to be I'll be positive almost no matter what we do. But uh, avoiding them is is ideal because once again, they're ch it's those are being used to change motility, which alters then your testing. And of course, you're trying to test them for what is wrong with them, uh, not for how they are, uh, how their gut is by doing extreme treatments to try and maintain normality. Uh, and then, uh, sad to say, but we have to tell people still, no smoking or secondhand smoke for at least one hour before the breath test, because that will disrupt the gas measurements. Uh, and then the other one is no sleeping or vigorous exercise for at least one hour before or during the test. Now, the test takes three hours long to perform, but yet patients aren't always doing anything for three hours. And some people are you know, really addicted to their exercise, but say no, don't do the exercise. You'll, uh, you need to kind of chillax and do something else in the meantime. Um, it used to be told to stop proton pump inhibitors uh, um, and other acid blockers prior to testing, but actually that's been disproven in research in that you know, even though they're probably on the proton pump inhibitor because they have SIBO, uh, the, in itself, the medication uh, and the and the uh, suppression of, of acids do not affect the testing, so that is okay to maintain on them, and hopefully then after uh, diagnosis and treatment, they can get off of them much easier. Additional prep diet suggestions that I put in there uh, uh, that are also good to know is that 12 hours before the test, the patient should stop any smoking or chewing gum. So in that 12 hours, even though they say it's a 12-hour fast, 
no, no gum chewing, uh, and preferably no smoking. Uh, bactericide uh, mouthwash can be used in the, in the testing and actually killing off a little bit of bacteria in the mouth sometimes can lead to a, a, a lower baseline measurement uh, because sometimes that uh, the, there's the bacteria is actually just fermenting some uh, sugars left over in your mouth and can lead to a false a little elevation. So that's perfectly fine. Um, and hyperventilation has been seen to reduce um, hydrogen breath levels. So it's important when, when you tell the patient when they do the collection, it's not how hard you breathe, it's just a normal breath you breathe out during the collection uh, and, the, and the vacuum tubes that are included in the collection materials will just capture that uh, a sample, no problem. Uh, once again, we talked about the prep diet is constipation is two days, uh, with diarrhea and anybody else is just one day. In that prep diet, and this is sometimes uh, where patients are trying to negotiate with you about what they can or cannot eat, but really this is what you can eat. Uh, it's not about what about this or what about that. It's like, no, these are just what you can eat. You can drink plain water, coffee or tea, no sugar, no sweeteners, no cream, no nothing. Uh, baked or broiled chicken, fish, or turkey, salt and pepper only, plain steam white rice, eggs, and if you want, you could have a broth, uh, but it has to be a meat broth, not made of any bones, not made of any cartilage. It can't be a, a yummy good uh, a bone broth. It has to be just a clear. So we oftentimes tell our patients to throw a piece of chicken a breast in a slow cooker, let it cook overnight, and that clear liquid can be used then. And especially if a person is doing a two-day prep diet for constipate with, with constipation, um, having a little moisture on their eggs and rice or their eggs or their rice and their uh, chicken, fish, or turkey is really nice. And for people with uh, with uh, autoimmune diseases where you're not producing as much saliva, it's essential. Now, if anyone is a vegan or a vegetarian and they're looking at doing this prep diet, they might say, well, there's really nothing here that I'm going to eat. Um, one thing that we did in our in our lab is that we we had uh, uh, we had people perform an elemental diet, so they drink an elemental diet formula uh, for their prep diet days, and that worked just fine. It was a nice, good, low baseline, so that's a good option for all those vegans and vegetarians. Um, overnight fast, as I mentioned before, is really important. It's 12 hours, no eating, no beverages, no gum chewing. And you can sip water, but no gulping water. So it's not a dry fast. You can still have a little water, but you can't gulp down like a huge liter of it. We have two different sugar substrate, substrates that we use uh, with our collection materials. We have gl uh, glucose and we have lactulose. Now, glucose, and, 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 and oftentimes, I think like in many in many different camps in medicine, people fall into favor of one or the other. And honestly, they're both sugar substrates, they both can be used and they're both very accurate. Um, the glucose uh, is absorbed exclusively in the small intestines, so you're gonna have a small intestinal measurement uh, pretty exclusively. Uh, and that's good and bad. One, it, it actually can create a more ac more accuracy in the measurement because there's no false negatives with maybe possibly a large intestinal measure measurement uh, being misinterpreted. Um, but number two, though, uh, it does cause your blood sugar to raise a little bit. So people with uh, poor blood sugar management might not be eligible for using it. Uh, and so that's an issue. The lactulose, lactulose uh, ha has become more popular in a lot of integrative medicine, uh, but it's interesting because glucose is favored by more gastroenterologists. Even though they can script lactulose, they actually choose glucose, mostly because, well, you're not going to have a false positive on it. The lactulose is, uh, is a little ideal for sometimes because it will not raise your blood sugar. Number two, it's absorbed in both the small and large intestines, which means sometimes it does get a little bit deeper in the small intestines, and you might be able to identify that someone has a uh, uh, elevated SIBO in that very lower 18 to 22, or 22 feet down in the small intestines, 
Um, and of course, that just might be kind of uh, on the razor's edge between the large and small intestines. Um, but there is that, 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 that benefit of that. So they both have good benefits. Um, the glucose uh, is technically going to give you more accuracy. You know, you're not going to get a maybe less false positives. The lactulose, you're not going to get the blood, blood sugar uh, spiking. Uh, either way, they're both uh, used uh, uh, hand in hand. In our laboratory at Neurovana, the percent positives that we see coming in, so the number of, of samples we receive from glucose uh, um, challenge test and the percent from lactose challenge tests are identical. Uh, there's no difference that we see on the number of positives or negatives between the two. And ultimately, if there was a big difference, we would see it there. One thing to note, uh, lactulose is a prescriptive drug in the United States. It's because it's a synthetic sugar that was uh, made at a, after a certain point in time. So the FDA designates it as a prescription. There's not many other countries in this world that actually designates it as a prescription, but yes, the United States does. Uh, and I have no idea why. And so if you are a prescriber, you can use it. If you are not, you need to get someone to sign off on it. Um, so recently in May, there was a uh, consensus paper published. It was the North American Consensus on Breath Testing. And it, it, it's been a big change in, what, in how we do things because you know, all these uh, uh, gastroenterologists and researchers that uh, uh, are really well known in their fields got together. They did some surveys and some uh, 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 networking and they came up with a position paper. And in that, 100% uh, of them agree that you should always do a SIBO test before any lactose or fructose breath test. Number two, positive findings. If you, uh, they, they concluded that you definitely uh, have certain markers uh, that can be met on the breath test that could be pretty much universally agreed upon as positive. That includes, so there's, uh, there's a set of, of criteria for glucose and a set of criteria for lactulose. The glucose uh, has smaller values because it's a little bit more sensitive than the uh, lactulose. And with that, uh, if you have a glucose, if you have a rise in uh, hydrogen levels uh, from the lowest preceding value to a peak of 12 parts per million or greater, you get a positive within 120 minutes uh, of, the, of, of consuming lact of, of, the, of the glucose. If you have 10 parts per million or greater of methane at any given time in that first 100 to 120 minutes, that's a positive for SIBO also. Or if you have a combined sum of hydrogen and methane from the lowest to the highest value within 120 minutes of 12 parts per million, it's a positive. Uh, that's for glucose. For lactose, uh, it, uh, you have 20 parts per million or greater uh, uh, from the lowest to the highest uh, reading within the first 120 minutes is a positive for lactose. Once again, only 10 parts per million is necessary at any given time uh, within the first 100, 100 to 120 minutes for uh, methane. And it's a combined total of methane and hydrogen increasing of 15 parts per million or more with lactulose. Once again, they're very similar, slightly different, and sometimes that makes a big difference. And for interpretation, it's very important to know. So what does that look like? Well, here's a, here's a, a classic example of someone who's hydrogen positive SIBO. This is where uh, uh, you have in the test result you get from Neurovana, uh, you'll get a, a couple different uh, reports. And I'm going to only show you today in this webinar just the line graph and the data table as part of our result page. We also have an interpretation page, which I will highlight in our next webinar. The, in this particular case, though, if you see along the table, there is the uh, uh, sample zero. Sample zero is the baseline measurement the patient does. This is where they fasted for 12, 12 hours, they woke up in the morning, they collected their breath, and uh, they and they measure. That should be the lowest uh, measurement uh, that is collected uh, in the ideal world. Then they drink their sugar substrate, whether it be glucose or lactulose, and then they collect every 20 minutes. As that sugar goes downstream, 
in in a perfect world you would have very little activity for that first 120 minutes and then you would have a little spike in activity towards in, in the large intestines in someone with SIBO and in this particular case with hydrogen they're going through and then they get to the 80 minute mark and then spike in activity that hydrogen production then at 80 minutes is a clear indicator of a small intestinal bacterial overgrowth producing hydrogen gases and it maintains uh, not only for the it maintains during two different test uh, uh, measurements and then it drops down and then it spikes back up when it goes to the large intestines a very classic presentation this is a classic presentation that you see with a lot of um, methane positive SIBOs more time than not when someone has a lot of methane activity their baseline is going to be elevated you see that all the time so hence if you have a, a baseline measurement of methane greater than 10 that's usually positive for SIBO just in itself uh, but in this particular case not only were they highly elevated at baseline but then uh, later on they also became extremely elevated. And this is a very significant uh, uh, methane SIBO overgrowth uh, and a very clear indicator of an abnormal activity. And just as a little floater, you can also sometimes get someone who's completely flatline and has no activity, which of course raises a flag also, because guess what? You should have activity in the, in the large and small intestines of some sort. Even if the small intestines has no hydrogen or methane activity, there should be in the large. That could be indicating uh, that person has a wiped out gut flora, or they might have uh, a condition called uh, SIBO from a source of hydrogen sulfide, which I'll talk more about in the next webinar, which is going to be November 30th, uh, part two, test result interpretation. So I think we'll jump into a, things in a little bit more deeper. So I wanted to highlight a couple things about the Neurovana uh, lab that uh, I run and operate along with my wife. Uh, one, uh, we are two practicing doctors. Uh, my background, I've, I've been in the laboratory industry for many years, uh, and uh, I've been a practitioner for many years. SIBO testing was a major change in what I did with patients and brought a lot of definition to the terms leaky gut uh, uh, and, and uh, um, dysbiosis. It helped me become laser focused in finding the root cause oftentimes in the gut. And so we are, uh, we are really passionate about what we do and we bring that to everything we do in every facet of our business. Uh, we use uh, Quintron branded uh, breath analyzers and collection materials only. So that's very important. Uh, some companies will uh, use off-label materials that were not designed to be used with the industry standard Quintron gas uh, chromatography machines. And uh, that's, a, that's, that's too bad. Uh, you should use uh, uh, everything that was designed to be used. This is what is, these are the materials used by your gastroenterologists, by your research laboratories, uh, by the experts in the industry. Uh, we exceed the uh, normal quality expectations that the lab manufacturer of the equipment mandate. So not only do we follow all of the standard operating procedures for the laboratory equipment, we actually go out of our way to make it even better because guess what? As doctors, we know that there's a big difference sometimes that one part per million can make on a patient's test interpretation. Uh, and so we're passionate. We Not only do we calibrate on a regular basis, we have a, a, a procedure where we calibrate the machinery uh, every five uh, specimens. This makes it so that every single person's results are tested um, and most effectively. And Neurovana, we do all this because we, lo we love what we do. We're passionate what we do. We only are doing breath testing for SIBO. And we, by doing that, we're offering it at the lowest possible price uh, of anyone in the industry. We're not in it for insurance. We're not trying to uh, uh, bill an insurance company some outrageous fee. Uh, we, do, we don't even bill insurance. We want nothing to do with it. We just want to offer a great low cost price for every person possible. Um, so 
uh, uh, we not only do we do our frequent calibrations, we also use the uh, carbon dioxide correction factor to make sure that every patient's sample is calibrated uh, 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 so you can, uh, um, similarly, this allows for a, uh, a more accurate measurement of the breath testing. It's, an, it's a standard now in the industry, still not performed by every uh, gastroenterology department, uh, but it is something that should be, do, should be done. Uh, in addition to that, uh, we, uh, we are constantly doing research to help uh, improve not only not, uh, uh, the approach for uh, identifying SIBO, but also for treating SIBO. So another thing that we do, which uh, I am really proud of, is that every patient sample that is sent to us, we promise you we will measure all uh, the first six spec uh, specimens that they uh, send in. That in means that if a, per a patient does not properly collect the baseline measurement, we will not throw out their sample. This is important. Uh, for some reason, many laboratories do this. It drove me absolutely positively crazy because sometimes this is very hard to get people to modify their diet for one or two days, to remove certain foods, to prepare for this, and to perform this test. Well, it, to throw the test out if their baseline measurement doesn't uh, isn't done properly is ridiculous and scientifically not valid. Uh, so we will measure because if you have uh, a, a measurement uh, anywhere that's positive in that first six samples, you may still re uh, reach a criteria that can be used to define a positive SIBO. So we do that. If a patient does have any specimens that are um, missing or not properly done, we'll make a note of that on your interpretation that we provide to you. We make note of it and indicate whether or not that may, uh, might have or might have not affected your testing, which really really helps uh, the conversation with the patients quite a bit. Uh, this is an example of a patient who did not collect properly, but obviously diagnostically easily met the criteria for SIBO. Uh, this would have been thrown out by many laboratories that are currently running uh, breath testing. So with Neurovana, if you're interested in, in starting to use breath testing with some patients, feel free to go to our website. You, uh, you could follow uh, the, the, pro the procedure for r running a test is really easy. Uh, sign up with us to, with an account. Uh, we'll send to you requisition forms. You fill the, you, when a patient uh, needs to be tested, you fill out the requisition form, you fax it in, and then we mail out the collection material directly to the patient with all the instructions. They complete the test at home and we have the uh, return postage included and they mail it back. Uh, uh, the requisition form is easy to fill out. Uh, we will customize it for you, so there's less uh, things that you need to fill out. You'll just need to fill out what test to order and the patient's information. Uh, when we, if we receive the if we receive the the requisition form uh, before 2 p.m. Central Standard Time, it'll usually go out that same day. Uh, we do ask, uh, uh, we, do, we do guarantee between one and two day uh, uh, mailing upon receive, receiving the fax. Uh, patient collection materials, uh, we send to them a nice letter, an overview uh, uh, to how to collect, and also a patient intake form so that we know whose test is coming back and a little bit of background history on them, uh, which helps us on interpretations. Uh, in general, uh, or in conclusion, uh, SIBO is a challenging and complex clinical condition uh, with many different multifactorial etiologies and symptoms uh, that can often be misdiagnosed. Uh, diagnosis is best determined by breath testing with a sugar challenge after a preparation diet, and most common labs, uh, most common labs don't de uh, de uh, test for SIBO. Uh, you oftentimes need to use a specialty lab like Neurovana. Uh, treatments include uh, antimicrobials, elemental diets, uh, diet restrictions, uh, etc. And we'll talk more about all that in the second and third webinar in our series. So uh, that concludes our uh, lecture for today. Um, I'd like to thank all of you for taking time out of your schedule for uh, attending this lecture. If anyone has a question, uh, what you can do is you can type into the uh, click meeting chat area 
and type in your question. I'm happy to answer it. Likewise, you have my contact information uh, here on the screen. Feel free, you can give us an email at the uh, CS, customer service at neuroavana.com. Uh, if you're interested in signing up with an account or need have questions uh, for our sales staff, give, give our sales staff a call at the number posted. Uh, 